Hey everyone. So today we are covering up two, or we are covering two topics, uh, which we didn't get to, or where I just didn't feel like they didn't fit in very well throughout the year. So we are putting them in right at the end. And luckily, there are some pretty simple uh, types of equations or types of uh, topics. It's just that. They're kind of oddballs that don't really fit in anywhere. So the first one we are talking about is going to be internuclear force. Internuclear force. And more precisely, we're going to be focusing on the internuclear force graphs. So what we got to do is we got to figure out pretty much the strength in between atoms and the distance in between atoms. So internuclear forces, they look something like this, obviously with a little bit more of a straighter line. Uh, potential energy is on the left, and that's in kilojoules per mole. And then uh, internuclear distance is this line right here. So internuclear distance, or just distance between the atoms. And they're going to go ahead and they're going to look something like this. And essentially what it is is that you're pulling these atoms apart and putting them or pushing them closer together. Uh, if you pull them far apart from one another, eventually they're going to want to come back together due to attractive forces. If you push them too close together, uh, they will want to get away from each other because of uh, having similar charged um, ions. So what you have here is from this top line down to here, that is our bond energy. So that is the energy between bonds. And then from here to here is the distance, okay, between the atoms. So this point right here is obviously uh, the most important. The From bottom to top, that tells you the bond energy. And from left to the, I guess, uh, trough, is the distance between the atoms. So what we focus on mainly is, uh, we focus on, fiddle right, there we go. We focus on bond order, which is just how many bonds there are. So we focus on bond order and distance. So if we're looking at three graphs here, I'm going to draw three of these internuclear force diagrams. There's one right here. There's one right here. And there is one right here. And let's say this is H2, this is O2, and this is N2. And if you remember, uh, these diatomic molecules. Hydrogen has a single bond. Oxygen has a double bond. And nitrogen, oh boy, that looks terrible. Nitrogen has a triple bond. So the bond order is one, two, and three. And the corresponding uh, internuclear graphs are going to look something like this. For hydrogen, the distance is going to be closer uh, to the y-axis, and uh, the potential energy dip is not going to be very large. For oxygen, they are a little bit farther apart because they're bigger atoms. The potential energy dip is a little bit larger, and it is further right again because those ions are a little bit further away from each other. And nitrogen, since it's got a triple bond, it's going to be a lot deeper trough and a little bit further right. Uh, nitrogen is the largest out of these three atomic radius wise. It's the furthest left. Uh, so it's got the furthest distance and it's got that triple bond. So it's gonna have a really deep potential energy. So keep that in mind that when you're looking at these bonds, uh, remember that from the Y axis to the bottom is the distance. So that makes sense because oxygen and nitrogen have much larger atomic radiuses than hydrogen. And then from the X axis to the trough, that is the potential energy. And it gets deeper as we go uh, in between these two because hydrogen only has a single bond, so it's got a little bit of a shallow trough. Oxygen has a double bond, so it gets a little bit deeper. 
and nitrogen has a triple bond, so it has the deepest trough out of all of them. So remember that bond length is just going to be from that trough there. Uh, a question that we saw on the AP exam was we had a situation like this, and they drew a potential or a uh, internuclear force diagram, and they said this was Cl2, and they said to draw Br2. Well, if you look at the periodic table, Cl is right here on the periodic table in the halogens, and Br is directly below it. So it does have a much larger atomic radius. And if you were to draw the Lewis structures for these, you would see that they're both pretty similar uh, in the fact that they only have a single bond. So what we're going to do here is definitely since Br is larger, we're definitely going to move it further right. Let me just draw it as a dashed line. But what we're also going to do is we're going to draw it a little bit shallower. So again, we drew it further right because the distance is obviously a lot larger for Br2 because they're much bigger atoms. Well, they are the same in terms of bond energy. So you'd think they'd be the same depth-wise, but remember bromine is larger, so they are farther apart. So that energy in the bonds is a little bit weaker. Since they're so far away, uh, their intermolecular or their internuclear force, sorry, is going to be less. Okay. Now, if it was something like if Br2 had a double bond, then you would definitely draw this trough deeper, but in this case, it is not. So let's go ahead and let's move on to our next, oh no, it won't let me end our page. Well, that's okay. Let's just go ahead and let's painfully erase all of this. Oh boy, I got a better idea, guys. Reload. Who needs... to erase when you could just, no, start anew. Okay, let's do it this way. New blank page. There you go. The struggle is real. All right, so now let's talk about absorption. Okay. Absorption. Absorption is just how much a solution absorbs light. Get out of here. How much a solution absorbs light? And we actually do this uh, with instrumentation in the lab. So what we do is we take this little plastic kind of rectangular prism thing, uh, and we call that a cuvette. And what we do is we take this cuvette and we'll fill it with some sort of liquid. Let's just say it's one molar NaCl. And uh, it has, you know, some particles floating around in there. And then what we do is we take that cuvette and we put it in this thing called a spectrophotometer. So we go ahead and now we've put that cuvette in the spectrometer and, uh, and we have a little light on one end of it. And what that light does is it shines light at that solution. So light will start traveling through that solution that has that particles. And then over here we have this detector. And as you can see, the light's going through the solution. Well, depending on the concentration, only some of the light is going to go through. So what that tells us is, is that if only a little bit of light goes through, that means that this solution has a high absorptivity or a high absorption. So high absorption means that it has a high concentration. It had, okay, shun. It has a high concentration. That means that there's a lot of particles in there that were able to block that light, not absorb it. That means that, or to absorb it. So that means that there was a high absorption. Let's say if we did this again, and maybe we did it, I don't know, with a 0.1 molar NaCl this time. Well, there's not going to be, as many particles in there. So then when we shine that light, my lovely light bulb. So when we shine that light and it goes through, 
there's going to be a lot more of it going through to that detector. So we're going to have a lower absorption. And actually, there is a calculation involving this. It's called the Beer-Lambert Law. And it's just simply A, or capital A, equals A, B, C. And again, this is called the Beer-Lambert Law. I don't know why I put an equal sign there. You don't need an equal sign. It's just the Beer-Lambert Law, okay? So A equals A, B, C. A just means absorbance. Absorbance. And there are no units for this, okay? So no units. It's just plain as can be, kind of like our equilibrium uh, constant. A is molar absorptivity. And it's different for every solution. And uh, the units for this are just molarity to the minus one and centimeters to the minus one. B is our cuvette length. So that plastic or that rectangular prism that we put the solution in, uh, that is just simply in centimeters, and it's usually always one centimeter. I've never seen a cuvette that wasn't one centimeter. And then C is just concentration. Which, once again, is in molarity. So A equals ABC. Uh, mainly on the AP exam, they like to show you graphs uh, of absorbance. They don't really do too much with this calculation, but we'll do one Anyway, let's say that we got a crystal violet solution. And it is at, let's just say it is at 1 times 10 to the negative fifth molarity. Okay, uh, we have a 1 centimeter cuvette. We put the crystal violet in there. And we measured the absorbance, and it read 0 0.75. Well, let's just calculate the molar absorptivity then. Well, of course, we got our just equation right here. Our absorbance is 0 0.75. Our molar absorptivity is what we're looking for. Our cuvette length is 1 centimeter. And our concentration was 1 times 10 to the negative fifth. Well, all we do is we take 0.75 divided by one, divided by one times 10 to the negative fifth. I got my calculator here. And we get a crazy big number because I just made up these values where our molar absorption is 75,000. And remember, that's going to be in centimeters to the minus one, molarity to the minus one. All right, guys, that is absorption and internuclear force in a nutshell, okay? Not into too much depth, just need to be able to answer some of those graphing questions, which we will get practice with now. So check out that practice. Let me know if you have any questions. Have yourselves a great day.